him. And I used to write him letters asking if he'd take me on his expedition. I was a kid of 15 or something. And the strange thing was he actually bothered to write back to me. I was living in Uruguay at the time, Montevideo. And he, they, they, they might have been form letters from Nat Geo, I, I don't remember, but I was so pleased to get these letters. And I just kept at him and kept at him. And he, you know, he'd say, oh, well, you're not a diver. And, uh, you know, one day I became a diver. I'd say, hey, George, come on, I'm a diver now, take me. And he'd write back, say, well, yeah, you're a diver, but you're not an archaeologist. And then years later, I became an archaeologist and wrote to him again, come on, George, take me. And um, then one day, not long after I'd arrived at Oxford University, I got a telegram from George saying, do you have Siemens papers? And I did, because somewhere in our correspondence, I told him he'd know that he knew that I'd worked at sea after leaving school. So I had Siemens documents, I had a, I had a Siemens passport and discharge book, all that kind of stuff. And he said, OK, join me next week in Turkey, except it wasn't Turkey. I had to go to uh, the island of Kos on, on the Greek side of the, of the uh uh at the eastern mediterranean and i didn't know what any of this was about but here was a chance to work in underwater archaeology with george bass so i just you know i went to cost like he told me to do and uh there i was met by a man called don fry who smuggled me into turkey in a kaiki i had to hide in the bow of this little fishing boat in amongst all these old fishing nets and by the time i got out two hours later in turkey i was just completely a mess of sores and every insect you can imagine had been sucking on me the whole voyage across and I was oh, I was in a state anyway so he got me into Turkey and then I found out what it was all about it was at the time of the invasion of Cyprus by the Turks and they didn't feel they had enough support from the Americans in that invasion so they closed down the American Air Force base at Izmir and they had to get out quick and they had this ex-US Navy T-boat and they had to get rid of that. That was their R&R &R boat uh, and they gave it to George and George was grateful for it. But then he found out if you got to operate a ship like that, you got to have a skipper with a ticket, you got to have an engineer with a ticket and you got to have two trained seamen. So there was me. And then he found out the ship was only registered to take something like 13 or 15 people. So he was looking for people who, who could fill several roles. They could dive, they could be an archaeologist, and in my case, also be a seaman. So that's how I got on. That's how I got started. And then I went to work with the Italians. I worked with the French. And then I got back to England, got back to Oxford, and I started working on the Mary Rose uh, down in the uh, south of England, sort of between Portsmouth and Isle of Wight. That was the great warship of Henry VIII, which has now been raised and on, on exhibition in, in Portsmouth. Wonderful, wonderful exhibition. And uh, while I was there, I, I, I met a man uh, called Alexander McKee. He was the guy who found the Mary Rose. And my then girlfriend, now my wonderful wife, of many decades, Joe and I, we were down there seeing Alexander. And he was a writer by profession and we were in his studio and the studio where he did all his writing was completely book lined everywhere, all walls, except for the top shelf. And the top shelf, there was an array of little bits and pieces, mementos and things like that, that he picked up in a lifetime of diving. A lot of that was in the Mediterranean, so bits of broken Roman amphora and stuff like that. None of it of any great interest, but there was one piece. And so I said to him, Alex, you know, where did I pointed up to it? I said, Alex, where did that piece come from? And he said, Menson, of all the pieces up there, why did you choose that piece? And, and I told him, I told him that it was an Etruscan amphora handle. I knew that from the shape. I told him it could be dated to about 600 BC, give or take a decade or two. Uh, I told him I knew it came from the sea because it was covered in marine deposits. And I said, if that came from a shipwreck, then that would be the oldest post-Bronze Age shipwreck ever found. And therefore, by default almost, it had to be of at least potentially outstanding archaeological importance. And then he told me this story. And uh, it was how 20 years before, in 1961, he'd been diving on this island called Giglio, uh, one of the Tuscan archipelago to the sort of the northwest of the Italian peninsula. And he had been at a dive school there, which is run by an English guy called Reg Valentine. 
And he said, Reg Valentine found this incredible wreck, the bottom of a reef in 50 meters of water. Wow. And, he said, and so, yeah, we went to meet Reg. And uh, while well, divers, uh, yeah, they, they keep their cards pretty close to their chest when it comes to wrecks. But after about, I don't know, three quarters of an hour of talking to Reg, we got on really well. He went upstairs and he came down to three or four old snapshots taken in 1961 uh, of him and his students sitting on the edge of this dive boat, looking at bits and pieces of pottery that they just cut recovered from the, from the wreck. And in that moment, looking at those photographs, I, I just, I knew straight away that I, I literally blundered into a wreck of really outstanding archeological importance. So I went back to Oxford University, long story short, we spent four seasons, long summers, working on the island of Giglio. It was a huge success. And at the end of that time, the archaeological superintendency for Tuscany, they had a summer long, no, it was long, it was about a year long, special exhibition in the what was then the new wing of the National Archaeological Museum in Florence. So there was I, still a student, uh, with this incredible exhibition going on in all places Florence and these days if you want to see the stuff from the Giglio wreck you go to the National Underwater Museum of Italy and the entire top floor is just devoted to to my work on Giglio and I'm quite proud of that and then of course my career just kind of exploded. The endurance was uh you know sort of uh what you call sort of well for me she'd kind of been my white whale for many years uh uh, she was a bit like um, you know, Don Quixote and his golden helmet of Mambrino, that kind of thing. She was the the most unreachable wreck in the world, and therefore, you know, any any search to find her had to be the greatest wreck hunt of all times, and it really was. I mean, we had two expeditions to try to find it, and we succeeded the second time round. But the but the problem was that she was three thousand meters down under the perennial pack. Uh, of the Weddell Sea, and that was the challenge, working under the ice, and that's why she was the the so-called unreachable endurance. So yeah, it, it was uh, it was a huge project, cost many, many, many millions, uh, and it took two attempts, but in the end, we we did succeed. Yeah, I, I we we found the wreck when myself and John were off the ship, and it was the only time we left the ship. Uh, we we'd uh, there'd been a period of really very difficult, dangerous weather. Uh, the captain was seriously concerned about the ship, and he'd said that you know couldn't take it much longer. Um, and then we had a period of two days of really, really brilliant weather in the middle of all these blizzards, and uh, you know it was it, the the cold, the temperature on the back deck, the wind chill factor had had dropped down to really, really dangerous levels. Um, Teeth, my, several of my teeth were, were cracked on one side uh fillings were popped you know it was that kind of cold and the guys in the back deck were heroes uh and they were really struggling though and then we came into those two days of really good weather and the meteorologist on board said you know once this period of good weather is over the weather is going to come back with an absolute vengeance and it's going to slam us and the captain said you know maybe I, you know, I might be able to last 24 hours, probably not even that. And then we've got to get out of here quick. So we were, you know, backs against the walls. It didn't look like we were going to find her. And uh, John and I had been talking for a couple of days about getting out in the ice and stretching our legs, except it was too dangerous to do it until then. So that morning, the 5th of March last year, uh, I opened my curtains and out to starboard, there was, we were locked in a, in a flow and out to starboard about, um, about two kilometers away. It's very hard to judge distances when you're in the ice, but it was about two kilometers away. There was this huge iceberg. So we decided we would head for the iceberg. So it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we layered up and we set off for the iceberg. And I did a really stupid thing. I changed the channels on our radios, but I forgot to tell the back deck. I told the bridge, but I didn't tell the back deck that we'd switch channels. And it must have been about half an hour or so after we'd left the ship. 
that this incredible image appeared on the sonar screens. And uh, it was really well defined. Um, it was obviously man-made. And the only man-made thing in the center of the Weddell Sea was, of course, the endurance. So they were getting really excited in this little tiny control wreck, only a uh, tiny control room on the back deck, only three people in there. And they called in a guy called Francois, who is uh he's he's considered one of the top four sonar analysts in the world. He used to be in the French Navy, you know, he was a Russian submarine chaser, you know, during the Cold War and things. And he he's he's the absolute tops. And he took one look at it and he just said, Satel it's her and uh they were trying to raise us in the radio and couldn't and we got back to the ship i don't know sort of 45 minutes after that something like that and um we we're getting out of our polar gear i'm absolutely frozen to bone and all i can think about is getting some hot fluids in me and get warmed up and a cadet from the bridge a young guy suddenly appeared at my shoulder and he said to me uh I'll never forget this. He said, Captain Bengo asked me to convey his respects and to say that your presence is required on the bridge immediately. Uh, and I'm sort of sitting there kind of saying, come on, just let me get, get a hot coffee and warm up here. You know? And then at that point, the tannoy system on the ship crackles to life. And really loud volume it's going Bound in shears, shears and bound to the bridge immediately, to the bridge immediately. And um, I sort of look at John, and he looks at me, and we both had very vivid memories of what had happened three years before when the, the mission to find the endurance had completely collapsed when we lost our underwater search vehicle, uh, submersible, it's worth millions, and it just disappeared off the face of the planet. Or the, the other scenario which presented presented itself to us was that maybe there'd been a really bad accident on the ship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're getting seriously concerned and we're racing up to the bridge. And as we're getting up the steps, I just happened to see at a corner of my, my eye, one of the French data analysts standing in a doorway he was, he was smiling, you know, from ear to ear. And, you know, if you just lost your, your search vehicle, yeah, I promise you, you are not smiling. Your face is just completely drained. Uh, but he was smiling. And so that moment, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, oh, you know, you know maybe this is a good thing, you know, and, you know, but I just dare and think it, you know, just thinking, oh, you know, please, God, let this be, you know, we get to the bridge and we tumble out on the bridge and Captain Knowledge Bengo is standing there at the main console at the center of the bridge. And beside him is a guy called Nico Vincent, who, to my mind, was the real hero of the last season, incredible uh, underwater engineer. And he strides up to me and he's got his iPhone. And he shoves his iPhone right in my face like that. And he said, gents, let me introduce you to the endurance. And it was an incredible uh, picture on the phone. Um, they'd gone on in and done a kind of high frequency sweep of the ship. And the vessel was really well defined, seen from above. And, you know, it's just, to my mind, sort of, you, know, you got to remember, this whole project was 10 years in the making. And this was a moment when it all, everything was funneling down to that, that second. You know, gents, let me introduce you to the endurance. And it was just incredible. Everything just kind of exploded. You know, there's <laughs> a moment of, of just total, absolute, undiluted euphoria.